occasionalism is a theory of causation. It is a radical theory because it denies causal capacity to all agents in the world. It ascribes all effects only one sufficient cause, good. So when I decide to raise my hand and my hand does rise, it was not me who caused my hand to rise, it was good. And when I touch a hot oven and feel burned, the hot oven is not what made me experience the pain, it was good. In this video, we'll go through some of the arguments of two major philosophers who defend occasionalism, Malbranche and Al Ghazali. Occasionalism usually strikes people as such a bizarre and counterintuitive account of how causation works in the world. But as soon as you examine closely how well defended it is by some of its strongest proponents, many layers of ridiculousness start to crumble. Before we zero in on Malbranche and Al Ghazali, let's do a brief overview of the history of occasionalism. In Europe, a group of philosophers known as the Cartesian occasionalists, among whom we find Cordemoy, Cloudberg and Gullinks, turned to occasionalism to solve the mind-body union problem. Descartes' dualism was a very solid theory and quite an intuitive one. Dualism is the idea that the human is made of two substances, an immaterial mind, which Descartes names res cogitans, and a physical extended body, which he names res extensa. The mind is the locus of consciousness, it is what experiences mental states like grief, pain, happiness, and the body is just a shell or a meat suit that the mind pilots around. But all this poses the problem of how can something on extended affect something material, and how can something immaterial be affected by what happens to a material body. Occasionalism solves this conundrum by positing that the body and the mind do not directly affect each other. It is God who intervenes and makes it look like there is causation and interconnectedness between the mind and the body. Cartesian occasionalists consider occasionalism to be essential for dualism to work. An omnipotent and omniscient God who is the necessary cause behind every effect in the world is the Cartesian occasionalists proposed solution to how two different substances can interact with each other. Malbranche is himself a Cartesian occasionalist, but he pushed the analysis of occasionalism much further. If we go back in history, much before the Cartesians, the Asherite school of philosophy and theology used occasionalism to account for all acts of causation in the world. Many Islamic philosophers outside the Asherite school were starting to incorporate a lot of Aristotelianism and Platonism, which the Asherite opposed because they they thought it undermined God's attributes of omnipotence and omniscience, Al-Ghazali is himself an Asharite, although his version of occasionalism is less extreme than that of Ashari or other more representative philosophers of the Asharite school. Now we look at the arguments of Malbranche, the continuous creation argument. Conservation is continuous creation is an old argument that predates Malbranche, but Malbranche expands the argument to defend occasionalism. It is worth noting, though, that not all proponents of continuous creation are occasionalists. Adherents to continuous creation say that, from the point of view of people, creation and conservation are two different acts, because God creates the world and then conserves it from being annihilated. But for God, creation and conservation are the same act. Conservation is the continuation of creation. For me to be created at this very time is beyond my power. I did not cause me to be created at this time. Hence, as time moves forward, I would also need the same power that creates me at this moment to create me in the future moment and to keep creating me, because being created is not within my power. The future existence of a thing cannot be the effect of its past existence. For example, the present existence of this pen is not the effect of its previous existence. The apparent difference between creation and conservation is only due to when creation is observed. People differentiate between creation and conservation when they think of creation as the initial act that brings the object into existence. People who consider that conservation is different from creation argue that creation is undertaken single-handedly by God, while the objects of the world have some responsibility in their own conservation. Also, creation happens at one single moment, while conservation is ongoing. Thomas Aquinas, though not an occasionalist, attempts to refute this view by comparing continuous creation to how the sun creates daylight. We have daylight because of the sun, and in conserving daylight, the sun keeps recreating daylight at every moment. Malbranche uses the same idea by claiming that God creates the objects of the world and keeps recreating them, and that if he stopped recreating them, they would stop existing. Malbranche writes, the conservation of creatures is on the part of God who acts not 
then but the continued creation. There is no difference between creation and conservation as the goal of creation and conservation is the same, the existence of the creatures. For Malbranche this entails occasionalism, because if God creates creatures at every moment, then every movement of theirs is willed by them but enacted by God. Amongst the philosophers who argue for continuous creation there is Descartes and Al-Ghazali, Al-Ghazali whom we'll talk about later in this video. Descartes defends continuous creation by arguing that the nature of time is such that each time unit is not dependent on the other. Hence our existence in one moment of time does not naturally extend to the following moment of time. We need to be recreated at each moment. It is like how a video can seem to be one continuous flow but when examined closely it appears to be made of separate frames. The substance mode argument. The substance mode argument is derived from Descartes' account for substances. So the mind and the body are two distinct substances. A substance can have modes. Modes are modifications of the substance. There are rules that specify the nature of modes. First, modifications cannot exist in the absence of a substance. Second, created substances cannot create their own modifications. Third, a substance's modifications cannot be transferred from one substance to another. Based on this, bodies cannot cause other bodies to move. Let's use an example. When one piece of a domino falls on another and causes it to fall too, it is impossible for the first piece to be the sufficient cause for the fall of the other piece. The domino piece is a substance and falling is a modification. A modification cannot be communicated to another substance. Consequently, the second domino piece was not moved by the first piece. The required knowledge argument. Another argument that Malbranche presents in defense of occasionalism is the required knowledge argument. It is the idea that for a thing to efficiently cause an effect, the thing must know exactly how to bring about the effect. Hence, the mind cannot cause the body to move because the mind doesn't know all the neural and muscular processes that it takes to move. It is God who detains this information. Yet, it suffices for a person to will to move a finger and the finger moves. Malbron says that people have always been able to move their bodies even when they don't know anything about human anatomy. He says that in fact people who know nothing about what it takes to make movements appear to move skillfully. The epistemic condition is not fulfilled. You cannot cause that which you don't know how to cause. We find the same argument expressed by another occasionalist, Gullinks, who says that the warmth we feel when we sit next to a fireplace is not felt by the mind because we feel the warmth even though we don't know the processes that initiate and allow the feeling of the warmth. Gullinks first uses the argument to refute the mind's responsibility for the feeling of warmth, then he extends the same argument to refute the fire's causal effect of the warmth. The fire too doesn't know how to bring about the effects of warmth that a subject experiences. So whenever a person moves, what the person really does is just create the occasion by willing the action and God causes the action to happen. Now let's look at Al-Ghazali's arguments for occasionalism. Al-Ghazali is one of the most prominent names associated with occasionalism and his are some of the strongest arguments in favour of the doctrine. And contrary to a lot of misinformation about Al-Ghazali, he indeed defended the study of science despite his defence of occasionalism through the idea of God's habits, which we will explore in this video. Also, Al-Ghazali's occasionalism is different from and more nuanced than the occasionalism put forward forward by the Asherite school of thought to which Al-Ghazali belongs. Most of his arguments for occasionalism are found in the 17th discussion in his book The Incoherence of Philosophers, where he attacks philosophers for what he considers their blind adoption of Aristotelianism and Platonism. The most prominent figures of this movement are Al-Farabi and especially Avicenna, who believe that effects follow naturally from their causes. Let's start by exploring a position of Avicenna that Al-Ghazali would try to refute through occasionalism. Avicenna's view is that the things in the world have essences and causal powers. These causal powers can either be active or passive. For example, fire has the active causal power to burn and cotton has the passive causal power to be burned. When fire gets in contact with cotton, the cotton burns. Al-Ghazali responds to the burning cotton example by saying that at the conceptual level what we observe is the burning of the cotton when it gets 
in contact with fire. However, fire is inanimate and it has no volition. Why should we have it to be the agent that causes the cotton to burn? The only thing that we have and that might suggest that is the occurrence of the burning which happens at the same time when fire gets in contact with the cotton. What we observe is that the burning occurs when the agent touches the cotton and not that it is caused by the agent touching the cotton. There is nothing that indicates that it is the fire alone which causes the burning. Avicenna responds to occasionalists by claiming that if natural causes did not bring about their effects then causation in the world would not be consistent. Fire could sometimes cause the cotton to burn and sometimes not. People could grow up into animals. The world would be populated with absurdities and there wouldn't be any scientific knowledge to be had. Al-Ghazali responds to that through the argument of the habit of God. He argues that what we observe in nature are co-occurrences. Every time fire gets in contact with cotton, cotton burns. But there is no way to say that the fire is the efficient cause of the burning. One can argue that there is unfailing regularity between the perceived natural causes and their effects. Not a single time does fire fail to cause the cotton to burn. Al-Ghazali says that this consistency is because of God's habit. God has determined rules for the world and he makes sure these rules are always respected except with miracles. And this is very important because it justifies the study of science. Because although all effects are brought about by God, God's habit is consistent. The volition argument. For a thing to be the efficient cause of an effect, it must have the power to cause the effect, the will to cause the effect, the knowledge of how to cause the effect, and life. This immediately excludes all inanimate objects because they lack the condition of life. Fire burned down my kitchen is a way to describe how an event appears because of God's habit, but it does not describe the reality of what happened because fire has no causal power. Al-Ghazali says that all accounts that describe effects to natural causes are metaphorical. So if you twist a man's arm and make him stab himself with a knife, whom would you hold responsible for the stabbing? The man whose hand planted the knife in his chest or you who forced him to do so? Of course you'd say you are the cause because you have volition. You had the will to cause the effect. Similarly, inanimate objects do not have any volition and hence are denied causation. Occasionalism is a theory of causation that accommodates God's omnipotence, agency in the world, and the existence of miracles. Plus, Al-Ghazali insists on the importance of the study of science even if causation happens through occasionalism. The argument of temporality. Al-Ghazali says that the observation of the world reveals that it's full of occurrence. Occurrence means all objects, events, and phenomena that occur, and they are all temporal. They have a beginning. They start at a certain point in time. We know that occurrence have started at a certain point in time either by directly observing their beginnings or by conceptualizing them. For example, me making this video is an occurrence and I observed when exactly it began. This t-shirt I'm wearing is also an occurrence. I did not witness how or when it began existing, but I can think rationally about how it was made and that its coming into existence happened at a certain point in the past. All occurrences have two characteristics. they temporal, which means they come into existence at a certain point in time time and they're subject to change. The logical entailment from the temporality of occurrence is that everything that starts at a certain point needs an originator who brought it into existence. Occurrence cannot bring themselves into existence. We can enlist propositions that describe the objects in the world. First, every object in the world is made of atoms. Second, time is considered an occurrence and is too made of atoms. Third, every atom is created with its accidents and cannot be disassociated associated from its accident. Fourth, every accident exists within a single time atom. Hence, all objects in the world are made of atoms and accidents that exist within single time atoms. A substance for Al-Ghazali and the Asherite school is made of atoms and their corresponding accidents. The atoms and their accidents cannot endure beyond one temporal moment because time too is made of atoms. Atoms and their accidents cannot be 
disassociated in actuality. They can be disassociated conceptually, but not in actuality. For example, when you think of a car, the shape, the color, and the size of the car are its accidents. The car cannot exist without its accidents, and the accidents too cannot exist without being linked to the car. Because the accidents cannot endure beyond one temporal moment, accidents are annihilated after every temporal moment. And because atoms cannot exist without their accidents, atoms are also annihilated after every temporal moment. This means that God is constantly creating, annihilating, and recreating objects. Since a substance cannot last beyond one temporal moment, it can't be the efficient cause of an effect in another substance. This leaves only one possible efficient cause good. Finally, we'll look at an argument that was used by both Al-Ghazali and Malbranche in pretty much the same way. A thing is an efficient cause only when it is a necessary cause. The argument is that for a thing to be the cause of an effect, it must necessarily cause the effect. What that means is that a real cause must always produce its effect. So if a cause sometimes produces its effect and sometimes fails to produce its effect, then it is not a necessary cause and hence it is not a true cause. Based on this condition, creaturely causes cannot be real causes because they can't necessarily produce effects. If God wants to prevent a creaturely cause from causing its effect, he can. This means that the creaturely cause lacks the quality of necessity. It is not a necessary cause. For example, if I want to raise my hand, God can stop me from raising my hand. Hence, I am not a necessary cause. To believe that God cannot stop me from raising my hand is to question God's omnipotence. Now this video has reached its end. Until we meet again, have a great day.